welcome to On The Radar, where we are counting down, well, I, I am counting down 10 board games that captured our attention this month that Watch It played and discussing why each one caught our eye. These are the games on our radar. Hey, I'm Chaz Marler, filling in for, well, Everyone, because as of the time of this recording, the rest of the Watch It Play team is over at PAX Unplugged, instead of, you know, being uh, here with me to film the episode. But the, the show must go on, as they say, which is why, before everyone left, they gave me a list of all of their game picks, so that I could stay here and do, do all the work. But no matter, because I am certain that my expertise as a professional internet board game connoisseur will be more than enough to cover any game that they could possibly throw my way. Such as Rodney's first pick this month, Fire and Stone Siege of Vienna 1683, which recreates the Ottoman army's invasion of Habsburg in the mid-17th century. I think I'm... Um I need more notes. Fortunately, I know exactly where to go to learn more about this game. Here we go. Fire and Stone, Siege of 1683, places you, a person who decided to show up today instead of going on vacation with your workmates, into one of the most dramatic sieges in history. With a completely different set of cards for each player, you will conduct deadly assaults against impenetrable fortifications, dig tunnels packed with explosives, and launch desperate attacks to delay your enemy's advance. You can even play powerful events with the power to change the course of battle! Oh, that's cool! Yeah, I can see why Rodney picked this one. In fact, Rodney recently posted pics of his pick while he was visiting our mutual friend Jamie Keggy of the Secret Cabal podcast in a stopover on his way to PAX Unplugged, because apparently Rodney requires a pre-vacation on the way to his vacation. The game's website states that, quote, it includes historical notes about the campaign and 17th century siege warfare, but knowledge of neither is required to play the game. But it might give you a tactical advantage, and I am here to help you. You showed up for me, I will show up for you. So let's just do a quick Google search for Vienna sieges, and here we go. Traditionally made of pork, beef, or even horse, these short lengths of thin parboiled meats were first smoked and canned in aspic or chicken broth in 1903. I may have made a typo. Well, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor that helped make this episode possible, Access Plus, featuring Access Plus versions of Dobble, also known as Spot It, Timeline, and Cortex, because games are for everybody. And everybody should have access to the benefits of games and the happy moments that they create. And that's why the Access Plus Studio has been working with healthcare professionals to develop a line of games adapted to people living with cognitive disorders. Games in this line are supported by scientific research and include guidelines to inform practitioners, caregivers, and patients on the benefits of the games and the cognitive functions that they support. The first Access Plus games were launched this fall and include Access Plus Dobble, Access plus Timeline and Access plus Cortex. And for more information about these games and the cognitive functions that they support, follow the link in this video's description. Plus, you'll also find a link to more information about the scientific experts and the research that goes behind the games as well. So make sure to check those things out, not just because they're sponsored, but also because that sounds pretty cool. All right, I, I will admit that Rodney's game pick did demonstrate a, a rare gap in my board game expertise. But now, with that one-time hiccup out of the way, I'll continue on to Monique and Naveen's first game pick, Eleven, football manager board game, which is about managing a football team. But not an American football team, European football. The one where you can't use your hands and 40% of the time games end up in a tie, which as an American, makes total sense to me and doesn't sound at all like you're just running around outside in the rain for 90 minutes. The game 11, which gets its name by counting half the combined number of goalkeepers present on the field, in addition to the total count of outfielders on both teams, divided by two, is an economic strategy game where your task is to own and manage and grow your own football club over the course of a season. This is accomplished by doing everything from hiring staff members to acquiring sponsors, expanding your stadium, and overseeing your club's social media presence. <laughs> 
finally, a game that understands the importance of being liked and subscribed to. Oh, if only everyone that was watching right now understood the importance of liking and subscribing the social media that you enjoy. I assume that one of the reasons why Naveen selected this game is because this is more about system management than actual sports ball. Because Naveen is a master of systems management. I have seen the man jumpstart a 63 Chevy Nova through the application of systems management alone. Uh, Matthew, though, on the other hand, is all about chaos. Which is why his first pick this month is the game Boop, which, as its title suggests, is all about... Boop. Ing. Ah, for goodness sake, does nobody just play Catan anymore? Oh, here we go. Boop is a deceptively cute, deceivingly challenging abstract strategy game for two players about booping their cats off of a bed before those cats boop your cats. <laughs> oh, of course, booping. Every time that you place a kitten on the bed, it goes boop. Which is to say that it pushes every other kitten on the bed one space away. Line up three kittens in a row to transform them into cats, because biology. And then get three cats in a row to win. Now, unlike other slackers on the team, Matthew actually took the time to leave me a note about why he picked this game, stating, quote, it's a cute abstract game that I really, really want. And then, he, he and Monique went on to, to make plans to play it together at PAX Unplugged, distracting him from providing me with any more notes about why he actually picked it. So, um. Fortunately, though, this abstract game with an abstract name, Boop, wasn't Matthew's only pick this month, as he also selected the game Oricalcum. Oh, come on, now you're just making up words. Oh, no, actually, uh, Oricalcum is a legendary precious metal derived from Greek mythology, eh? expertise. And now it's also the name of a tense and fast paced strategy game designed to play similar to a short for X style game. In this one, each player has their own island board to explore and develop as they recruit hoplites, construct buildings granting powerful bonuses, confront monsters infesting their island, and produce the aforementioned oracalum, cal oracalcum theme. To prevail, a player will need to build majestic temples, forge tokens, and win the favor of titans. And then, the first to earn five victory points while clearing their island of monsters wins the game. This one caught Matthew's eye because it's, quote, a 4X game that's quick and simple and streamlined, which sounds good to me. Plus, it's from a great designer, and it's been described as playing like a streamlined version of Cyclades. Oh, well, now I want this one too. And I have it! Ha <laughs> ha! But ancient Greece isn't the only place to find precious metals and minerals like Oracalcum. There's also the moon, as demonstrated in my first pick of the month, Sky Mines, which I also have right here to share with you, where adventurous companies and private investors take to the stars in bold new mining endeavors the way nature intended. And you, as one of those investors, increase the profitability of your operations by spreading outposts, supporting scientific research, and mining and monetizing the most moon-made materials. This sounds like something I would have written for Paula. Regardless, I have mentioned Sky Mines in several other videos this year, and every time that I have, my anticipation for this game has ratcheted up and increased. I never played the game that's based on Mombasa, Mombasa, or a calcum, but I have been intrigued by it ever since hearing a review of Mombasa several years ago on the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast hosted by our mutual friend Jamie Keggy, as you may recognize from when I mentioned him a mere minute ago when recounting Rodney's pre-vacation vacation exploits. Regardless, I was never able to track down a copy of Mombasa, and that's okay, because I prefer, I think, the sci-fi theme in Skyminds anyway. <laughs> Ends here now, which is great, because I cannot think of any other recent games that take place on the moon. Up next is another recent game that takes place on the moon, Luna Capital. Monique Naveen also picked this one, where astro architects compete to build a settlement on the moon that will become the moon's capital city, because that's how government works. This is accomplished by best utilizing a series of construction cards and a common market and a set of project tiles. 
Cards must be placed following certain rules. And then tiles are placed on card spaces in order to group together various projects in the most efficient way possible. But what led Monique and Naveen to pick this puzzler? Well, that is a good question, actually. And according to Monique's notes, uh, she says, quote, uh, before leaving for PAX Unplugged, be sure to write a short blurb uh, for why I picked Luna Capital. Which I think we all can agree means that Luna Capital presents a drafting situation where the players must coordinate their selections to create a synergy between their cards and tiles in order to trigger potential layout and set collection bonuses, and it does this while remaining relatively brisk and quick playing. Well put, Monique. I couldn't have said it better myself, although technically, I guess I just did. And speaking of things that we were all supposed to say, well, the entire Watch It Played cast was going to join me at this point in our video to perform an elaborate promo for the Watch It Played Patreon, featuring costumes and jokes, stunt work, a musical number, and a limerick made in quite questionable taste. But no, no, I, th I think this is just as good of an approach. Just a guy sitting at a table, talking to a camera, promoting a Patreon alone. Meanwhile, the office refrigerator hasn't been cleaned out in a year and a half, and I swear I saw something move in there. And now let's raise a glass and make a toast to Monique and Naveen's next pick, Dom Pierre. Based on the 17th century French Benedictine monk in charge of the wine cellar at Old Tiver Abbey, who made an important contribution to differentiate wines of that region. This is a game that is more about winning prestige than earning money. And accomplishing this requires making continuous improvements to your vineyard while constantly reacting to your opponents and optimizing the available choices to build the most prestigious champagne maison. Now the hubbub bubbling up is that this is a Euro game that weaves together a multitude of intertwining mechanisms which can increase the game's learning curve. As such, this seems to be a game that rewards playing it more than one time, as it may take an additional game of it to fully come to grips with all of the options that you have available and how they connect. As such, if you enjoy a weighty, thinky, economic game, like I know Monique and Naveen do, well, then you may also enjoy Dom Pierre. Or maybe you just want to haphazardly hurl hexes at your opponents until someone wins. In which case, you may want to check out Rodney's next pick, Wiz War, in which wily wizards wage a no-spells-barred magical duel deep in an underground labyrinth. Now, Rodney recently shared some video clips on social media, after he, he took the time to like and subscribe to it, which were taken during his dive into this devious dungeon, which I have taken the liberty of stealing off of the web and sharing with you now. Come on now. Look how cool this is. We're in a maze. We're gonna be whizzing and warring. We're playing Wizmore. Jamie. Right. <laughs> Jamie and Matt. These two have played the game before. I'm new. I'm gonna get beat up. This game, first of all, these are custom pieces that you built together from mm -hmm. uh, Wiz Kids. I think they're called Wizard Lock tiles. And did you make this this is the exact same thing as the yes, boards the that come in? Yes, okay, the okay, okay. box. Look how cool, like the, the models, these are models from GW that you right, painted yeah. up. Look how awesome these look. And that is, is, this is like wacky, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Sure, yep. Because you talked about this on the podcast a bunch. For mm -hmm. years, yeah. you've been talking about this game and I've never oh, played yeah. it. I love it. It's the, the spells are weird. We cast spells to rotate You just tiles, did it. This whole thing walls. just rotated. You were like, I don't like the paths that you guys have to me. Whoop. Oh, Robbie, but, you're coming down the, 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 the hallway there. I'm going to put a rose bush in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. And you can, you, right, you can conjure stuff. There's, yep. Uh, you got a whole mess of cards. They're just a, can yeah, items us. you can carry that you can have the ability to like throw spikes at people. And yeah, yeah. it's and anything you can kind of stuff. imagine, right? Turn into a werewolf. Yeah, I've, I've been looking at my hand of cards. There's all kinds of, it's like game breaking stuff. It's meant to oh, be yeah. mm -hmm. really it's bananas. Over the top. It's over the top. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait. We're going to get into it right now. Wizmore, I'll report back after it's over. We'll see how it went. See ya. Now this machination of magical mayhem was first published back in 1983 with various versions following that and an eighth edition in 2012. That's the version that Rodney recently played with Matt and Jamie, even though the game easily supports a fourth player who I'm sure could easily remotely join in over Zoom and all you guys had to do was ask. But no, no one asked. Better luck next time, which could be the ninth edition of the game, which is scheduled to be coming soon from Steve Jackson Games. But a specific release date has not yet been established. However, 
when it does arrive, well, it will help ease the pain and make this game available to many who haven't yet had the chance to play it during its 30 year history. Yeah, 30 years that this board game has been around. Does a game being reprinted 30 years after its original release date qualify as it being an evergreen game? What if the game itself instead is evergreen? As in the case of our next game, Evergreen in which players compete to build a lush ecosystem by planting seeds, growing those seeds into trees, and placing other natural elements on their planet, trying to make theirs the greenest globe of all. This is done by selecting biome cards from a common pool to determine which area of one's planet will be developed next. But the cards not chosen make those regions even more fertile and thus more valuable. And so creating a winning forest will require growing trees, planting bushes, and placing lakes, while also gaining additional actions by harnessing the very power of nature. Now, at this point, I have com completely lost track of who has picked which game, but I have heard just about everybody on the Watch It Play team mention Evergreen at one point or another. And I think that it's easy to draw parallels between this game and the game Photosynthesis. They're both all about optimizing the placement of plants in order to soak up the most sunlight. Even so, I think that Evergreen still brings enough new ideas and twists to the concept that it's able to stand up on its own as well you know, as its own game. Let me know what you think down in the comments and if you know of any other games out there that bear a resemblance to previously published ones but still stand on their own merit. And that trend is gonna continue with my last pick of the month, Avatar The Last Airbender Fire Nation Rising, a cooperative card and dice game for one to five players in the Rising line of games from the op, which started, actually which started with this guy right here, Dados Rising. The series includes at least a half dozen other games at this point. And this Avatar version lets players take command of Avatar Aang, Katara, Sokka, Toph, and Zuko, and then go recruit heroes from the four nations and battle a variety of villains leading up to the day of the Black Sun, all while advancing their position on a balance track, while the villains advance on the matching ruin track. The games in the Rising series always feature a set of differently colored dice with a variety of symbols on them, which I think is really well suited to the abilities of the four different nations in the world of Avatar The Last Airbender. It's a version of the game that I cannot wait to get to my gaming table. And for 10 more games hitting gamers tables, continue on to the People's Choice Top 10, which is counting down the most popular games that our viewers are playing right now. Or any of the other entertaining instructional videos on the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you over there.